The way that we like to explain Community Solar to subscribers is that they don't actually buy this power. They buy a Groupon. So oh, they yeah. pay $90 and get $100 worth of value on their utility bill. It's not always going to be 90 and 100, but it's always going to be X percent discount on whatever we can generate on their behalf. So maybe one month it'll be $100 of value that they'll have to pay 90 for, keeping $10 as a discount. The next month we had more sunlight because it's a better month from a weather perspective. And they got $200 and they saved, again, 10% discount. Now it's 20 bucks. Community Solar has been coined the fourth vertical in the solar revolution. I am here with one of those entrepreneurs who is leading a company focused exclusively on community solar and how to grow it. Mostly, how do we find those ever important subscribers, those customers who are buying the power from community solar projects? My name is Nico Johnson. I'm your host here at the Suncast Media Zone live at Midwest Solar Expo. The Media Zone is brought to you by Solar Simplified. I'm joined by Aviv Shalgi, the CEO of Solar Simplified. Thank you for partnering with us on the stage, as well as joining us here to talk about how the community solar sector is evolving. Good to see you. Of course. Thank you for having me. So I mentioned that there are different players and the market is in this process of maturing for community solar. One of the roles that I feel like is less understood, maybe the least understood, is the role of the aggregator. It's a term that I hadn't heard until maybe about a year ago. Help us understand what is an aggregator with regards to community solar. I mean, you can think of all of the aggregators as a nice name that encompasses everything related to subscribers. So we yeah. aggregate projects, community solar projects on the one side, we aggregate subscribers on the other side, and we try to mix and match the two yeah. to make sure that everything is working correctly for everybody's benefit. Yeah. And so, you know, we come in usually after the developers already found the land, got the permits, figure out they're going to build a project. And before the project is actually getting built, partner up with developers to figure out who are the right subscribers, residential, mass market, low income, small commercial, mom and pop shops, large commercial, whatever it is, yeah. depending on the regulatory environment where that actual product is going to get built in and then actually execute on that plan, promoting the project to subscribers, getting them to sign up, making sure that it's simple for the subscribers to sign up. That's why we chose the name Solar Simplified. Have them go through that process, match them to the right project, and mm. at the end, making sure that the actual savings show up on their bill on a monthly basis. So your job is to go out and find customers for the developers who are building these solar projects. All the electrons coming from these solar projects need people to buy those electrons. Do but these subscribers really understand what they're signing up for? Uh, I would hope so. <laughs> like, that's my goal. Obviously, I mean, different people will have different levels of interest. How deep do they want to go in understanding <clears throat> what's happening here? Yeah. But in most markets, the way that we like to explain community solar to subscribers, um, which is legally correct as well, is that they don't actually buy this power. They buy a Groupon. So oh, they'll yeah. pay $90 and get $100 worth of value on their utility bill. Ah. Now... It's not always going to be 90 and 100, but it's always going to be X percent discount on whatever we can generate on their behalf. So maybe one month it'll be $100 of value that they'll have to pay 90 for, keeping $10 as a discount. Yeah. The next month we had more sunlight because it's a better month from a weather perspective. And they got $200 and they saved, again, 10% discount. Now it's 20 bucks. Yeah. And they had to pay 180 for Is it always benchmarked at a certain percent discount? Is that the guarantee? Yes. Yeah, so the guarantee in community solar across the entire countries, 99% of the time, I want to say, is a fixed discount per on a percentage level, not yeah. dollars. Okay. Um, um, and then the fluctuations just depend on the weather. Do you, as an aggregator, have to go interface with the utilities? Is it your job yep. to make sure the utilities understand the billing protocol and yep. manage all of the, how the kilowatt hours are exchanged? That must be quite complex. Right. How do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, so we're a tech company. Everything's automated. Yeah. Uh, we have algorithms that we build in-house that help us to manage that flow so that people can maximize their savings as quickly as possible, but obviously keeping everything within the regulatory compliance mm -hmm. of the specific state. And we have to do this exercise actually twice with the utilities. So we have to do it upfront on 
how much people are going to be are going to be getting in the yep. future. And then once that energy has been produced and was allocated to people's bills, getting all of that information back. Get the true up. Exactly. Ah. True up and be able to inform the subscribers, hey, go check your bill. You should have gotten $23 in savings last month. Okay. Go double check your bill and see that it's actually there. 99% of the time it's there. Yeah. But we want to make sure that we're communicating with our subscribers. Are subscribers opting into these community solar projects expecting a discount off of all of their electricity? So I used to pay $100 of all of my electricity. Now it's 90 and it's clean energy. I mean, that seems like a no-brainer option. Yeah. yeah. So I assume that's what they expect. That's what at least the, our subscribers communicate with us. That, sure. that is their expectation. That is also our goal. Yeah. Obviously, we don't control the weather, so we can't promise anything, but yeah. the way that our algorithms work is that they are trying to maximize your savings up to the full amount of your bill. But yes, there it, it, it's a lot of back and forth and making sure that people understand what they're signing up for, remember what they signed up right. for after a couple of months because some of the utilities are slow. Yeah. Things take a while. So yeah, it's a lot of communication back and forth and a bunch of really smart tech people and algorithm people behind the scenes to make sure it's actually working well. I think what's fascinating is that most consumers probably would not assume that by opting into clean energy, solar energy, right. they're going to pay less. And what it says is two part. One, we are still doing a relatively poor job of educating those consumers. Correct. That two, we have a power plant that now is below the generation cost of traditional fossil fuels. Correct. And it's the only way we can offer it right. is that we're actually producing power at less than the alternative cost, which is we used to be the alternative, but now fossil fuel is the alternative cost right. and it's higher, which is why we can guarantee this product. I feel like that should engender a sense of trust and relationship between you, the aggregator and the consumer. I know that we will talk in a minute about how the developer relationship works, but I feel like there are times where I see or I feel like I sense that aggregators working on behalf of developers. Can you contrast that in terms of the trust relationship that the consumer should have for you as the aggregator? Right. So, so unfortunately, I think people have heard in this country a lot about green energy and solar and hydro and wind and all sorts of stuff from so many different angles that they yep. get confused. And so that trust in many places around the country has actually been broken. We're, yeah. We need to re repair it and try to rebuild that trust because unlike any other product that's out there right now in the country, this is a guaranteed savings product right. that is highly regulated by state governments, by the federal government, by so many different agencies that we literally cannot charge you more. Yeah. We have to give you that discount and the utilities make sure that that discount is applied to your bill. Yeah. And so there should be trust. I think there isn't because of a lot of confusion yeah. to your earlier point. As an industry, we have not done the best job at educating subscribers and educating the market on what we're offering. So that is a part of our job when we're going to talk to subscribers, you know, because we want our subscribers to be there for as long as possible. We right. don't want to acquire subscribers all the time and mix and match. And so for us to be able to do that, we have to rebuild that trust with whoever it is that we're approaching to in order to get them to sign up, basically. So let's turn from consumers to developers because the folks that actually get these projects built are the developers you partner with necessarily. You partner with developers because they're generating those electrons and they're relying on you, the aggregator. In many ways, what folks may, may not understand is the developers need to choose. There are a dozen, maybe two dozen right. different folks they can partner with to help them essentially retail that electricity to consumers. Right. Yet the residential sector is very mature. The utility sector is very mature. I sense still in the community solar sector that we have a bit of growing left to do. What will it look like when we do reach a level of maturity that's a, that, that starts to reflect more of how the industry has already achieved that success and that, that maturity versus the relative immaturity we see right now in the community solar market? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can slice and dice that question five different ways. But I mean, I think on the subscriber side, we have not reached the product market fit that you would think like residential solar folks have reached to. Sure. When a residential solar company approaches somebody to put 
solar panels on their roof, you kind of understand what they're doing. You don't know exactly the ins and outs, but you understand what they're explaining. Right. This niche in the industry under community solar is just so new. People just don't know that this exists. Yeah. And so we have to go to the education. We have to go through the explanations and make sure everybody understands. And then we also have that on the developer side. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of developers that don't know what's out there. Yeah. They don't know any aggregators or maybe they know one aggregator because their buddy works there. Yeah. And they just don't know how the industry works and they know they don't know what terms they should agree to, what prices are out there, how risk sharing works, how things could be better or worse for their business. And now we're talking about developers, but there's usually an asset owner that buys it from the developer. There's a bank that loans a bunch of money like a mortgage. Yeah to the asset. There's tax equity, there's so many different types of yeah. financial players behind <clears> the developer that we also as an industry have to kind of mature and get to a level where everything is kind of standardized Yeah, and everybody's, I wouldn't say everything is the same, but everybody are playing in the same level that needs to be a much higher level, I think, than what where we are right now. Yeah, you mentioned standardization. I get the sense that there are a number of folks in the value chain who seem to be accepting the status quo right. rather than looking at the other sectors and saying, well, why aren't we doing it that way? Could you talk about the various players and how that acceptance of the status quo is creating, is, is perpetuating this immaturity? Yeah. I mean, I obviously don't want to mention any names and, and I love most of the people in our industry. <laughs> Everybody's great. And we're all really trying to continue to build the industry as a whole. You know, a developer told me this a couple of weeks ago, uh, one that we are not working with. He was basically saying, I prefer the devil I know to the devil I don't. And I, he's just like, I know that I'm kind of getting screwed. Uh -huh. But I don't have the time or the mental capacity to focus on figuring out what's better. I kind of got fast. used to it. Yeah. And it's okay. And it kind of, I'm sorry to say it, it, it sounds really bad to me as, as an outsider. I'm not a solar person. Yeah. It's not my background. I'm a software guy. It sounds really bad to me looking from the outside in when people are saying, I know I'm getting screwed and I'm okay with it. Like, <laughs> no, you should not be. Yeah. Like it is, it's literally your business. It's your livelihood. Yeah. You should care more about understanding what's out there, what's the different approaches, who are right. the different players who offers what, so you could maximize your shareholders, you know, interest and your employees' interest and all of your stakeholders in your company. Is the way that tax equity and debt are handled in community solar structurally different from other types of solar projects? And, and if not, how, how do you see this dynamic playing out in community solar in a different way? Because it does to me feel like it's, the, it, the role playing is different, even though it's a similar asset. Right. I don't know if it's different. Most folks tend to have all three. Yeah. So an equity sponsor that owns the project, a tax equity that helps to get the tax incentives, yep. and a lender or a bank. I know different ones have sometimes, you know, two of the three. Mm -hmm. You usually don't see just one. Right. Um, you know, it's usually never just a sponsor. It's a sponsor with a bank or a sponsor with a tax or all three combined. I think there's definitely a kind of a misalignment of incentives between those three, because obviously the bank wants the most stable thing possible. Right. They do not want to take any risks. Tax equity wants to rip the rewards off as quickly as possible and just make sure nothing gets screwed. On the flip side though, sponsor equity, the actual asset owners, the IDPs that buy these projects, they want to maximize their value. Those don't always align with, let's say, the safest approach the bank would take. Yeah. There's a little bit of, you know, conflicting interests, I would say, between different types of players. Yeah. We're growing as an industry. Well, again, we need to get to some standardization. And even if you talk to lenders and banks right now, there is no standardization if you on how you get a loan for a project like right. this. Um, although if you look at utility scale, utility scale is kind of standardized Pretty already. Baked. But they've had 20, 30, 40 years extra to figure these things out, we're kind of all learning very, very fast as we go. There seems to be, as we've this sort of highlighted, a lack of sophistication. And I feel like it is in particular around 
the various risk sharing mechanisms. And we have great examples from real estate and other areas where risk is mitigated in different ways and there are different risk sharing mechanisms to offset the lopsided imbalance that we see sometimes, in particular in community solar. Can you talk to that point? Yeah, so, so I would say there's like two sides maybe to that question. Let, let's maybe talk about the, the risk sharing in, in terms of you know, what we do with developers, for sure. example, how we share our risk. If you th we're sitting right now in the lovely Hyatt Hotel here in Rosemont outside of Chicago, hotels in general are not the name that you know on the door. There's mm -hmm. a building owner, there's the name on the door, the brand, Marriott, Hyatt, Hilton, etc. There's the actual operator of this facility. Right. And they figured out over the past 100, 200 years how to share the risks. And so if the operator does something they're not supposed to be doing or they're not keeping the performance as high as they're expected, they're going to have to compensate the building owner and the brand. Goes the same way with the brand doing the same like causing an issue or something like that yeah. where the, the operator can't do their job well. Same goes for the building owner. If the maintenance of the building is not up to standard, it's going to hurt everybody else's revenue. Yeah. They have to compensate each other. That doesn't really exist in community solar right yeah. now. You know, when what we've taken on ourselves at Solar Simplified with our developers and our IPP partners is to you know, make sure that Every agreement they sign with us, where we are the aggregator, we take our risks on ourselves. Right. So if we subscribe the wrong subscriber and they've canceled very fast, doesn't cost anything to replace them, and we will do it in-house. It doesn't even get communicated to them unless they're interested, obviously. Because if we messed up something, we want to make sure we make them whole yeah. as fast as possible. Same goes for collections. Let's say it's a utility that's not paying, not funneling the money on time. We are the face of that project with the subscribers, with the utility, with the local government, etc. Yeah. We're going to be the ones who go and fight with the utility to get the payment, basically shielding the developer and the asset owner, especially the bank, which we talked about, doesn't want to deal with non with collections issues. Right. We'll be there to offset that payment, make them whole, and go and fight with whoever we need to fight with yeah. her to collect the money for that project. I guess it might be helpful to hear how other, other ways that it's done, because what I hear you saying seems completely reasonable, and it also makes me think like, well, the way that it's being done, somebody's getting screwed. Yeah, so unfortunately the way, because it's a very new industry, I mean, we're less than 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and actual projects being operated, I would say like, eight, nine years or like right. the longest tenured projects out there. Um, so the way it's been going on right now is that developers and IPPs basically carry all of that risk. Uh -huh. Most of my competitors, unfortunately, are kind of an outsourcing out. Mm -hmm. You want customer acquisition, that costs some money. You want management, that costs some extra. You want billing, that costs extra. Oh, and they don't do collections. Like if customers pay, great. Customers don't pay or if utilities don't pay, Mr. Asset Owner, Mr. Developer, that's your side of the, of the problem. That's uh, not our side. Wow. We're just outsourcing. I think there's, there's a pretty big imbalance in the risk where the developers actually end up paying for services. But if, let's say, that aggregator subscribed the wrong subscriber, the subscriber doesn't understand what right. they signed up for, they're very quickly going to cancel or they're definitely not going to pay for what they, for the energy, those savings that they've, you know, that they've signed up for. And the problem with that is that money that's not getting paid or that ch very high churn is going to cause more problems for the developer because the developer gets to carry all of those risks and has to pay to acquire a new subscriber. They have to take the bad debt, the losses in collections because most of us don't actually send collections people to go to people's house and get the money back. It almost sounds like the way lead generation has right. been done, right? right? You pay for the lead. Whether they buy or not is not my problem. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How exactly. interesting. Well, it's wonderful to know that as the industry matures, folks like Solar Simplified are standing in the gap and saying, you know what? We see an imbalance here and the risk being shared. We're going to take some of that on. Thank you for illuminating us as well on this role that the aggregator plays, I do think that not only is it a crucial role because it is the energy retailer, but it's an often misunderstood role. And I feel like the aggregator is the one that 
while they do hold an uh, probably an outsized amount of power in the in the power imbalance, it's an underappreciated uh, part of the of the necessary process because community solar does have this interesting dynamic, like you said with this hotel, that you need someone to bring folks to stay in the hotel, right? Right, and that's not going to be the building owner, right? And it's not going to be CBRE, right? Or JLM, like those companies are not interested in occupancy rates, right? They're interested in optimization of, in this case, the asset on right. a solar farm. It's optimization of the electrons and making sure that at the connection point, it's delivering every electron that was promised. Right. So a company like Solar Simplified is able to step in the gap and say, we will bring the customers, we will fill, make sure you've got an accessible and right. acceptable occupancy rate. What is the typical, uh, let's co continue this term occupancy rate. What's a typical you know, fulfillment rate that's acceptable for a project? I mean, my book, 100%. 100%? Yeah. Or I would say like 99.9. .9. The one thing, like the number one reason we see cancellations, yeah. um, which I believe should be the number one reason f across the entire industry, is death. We don't know how to solve people wow. dying. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that's a different well, startup that somebody else could, could decide and figure <laughs> out how to solve Brian it. Johnson from Braintree is figuring that out. He's right, right. <laughs> Him or Elon or yeah. Bezos or somebody. My goal is to keep everything at 100%. Wow. Because we're at the end of the day. And you backfill when they fall out. Exactly. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're giving away money to people as savings. Yes. This should not be hard. The no. only reason why it is hard is it because of the lack of trust we talked about in the That's beginning. Right. Because the people don't understand what they're signing up for. General they confusion. They don't understand. Or, or maybe they do understand, but there's no trust with the aggregators to make sure that we're at hundred percent at all times. Yeah. But that's my goal. We've been up and running, I want to say for four years, never have gone down below like 99.9%. .9%. Wow. And so, you know, because our Stellar. subscribers actually understand what they're signing up for. Yeah. We take the time to make sure they understand. And so that's how we're able to keep those numbers. And if those numbers drop to your point about occupancy, the occupancy drops, that's less revenue for the developer, meaning, not as much money to be able to afford to build more solar right. and expand throughout the country and get more renewables deployed yeah. and more savings deployed to people. Yeah. So we have to make sure that they're making money. Because if they'll make money, we'll have a lot more community solar throughout the country. Fantastic. And that's what this partnership is all about. And that is Solar Simplified. I'm glad that we had a chance to dig deeper into how community solar works and the role of the aggregator. Aviv Shalgi is the CEO and founder of Solar Simplified. I'm Nico Johnson, your host here at the Suncast Media Zone live at Midwest Solar Expo, presented by Solar Simplified. Thank you for joining us today, Aviv. Thank you for having me.